um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I am solo, of course, on this this opportunity. Um, Wanda, some of you ladies just were with her in Camden with a ladies retreat, and so uh, she texted me just as we were singing the first hymn, and uh, she said they were heading to Portland, and so we will meet up in Portland. So she did ask, I was asked a while ago, says if I had lunch plans, I said I do now, I have a date with my wife, and so we are meeting uh, at the airport, and uh, I, then we will go find some uh, lunch for ourselves together. This is very unusual for us to be in different places, at least we're in the same state, but uh, last month I was in California, and we had another ministry going on at the same time, and I needed her to go there, and it was a retreat that was uh, a Spanish retreat in Iowa, so she drove from South Carolina to Iowa and returned home over a course of about five or six days, and she drove about 3,000 miles doing that, which is uh, not something she typically does by herself. And uh, I flew to California from Greenville and was out there for about two weeks, and then we were able to join back up in uh, South Carolina. And then this trip started off a week ago Saturday. We drove to southern Ohio and ministered there a week ago uh, this morning, then up to uh, Grafton, Ohio, to the home office where we have council meetings twice a year, and I have to be a part of that. And then Thursday morning, I put her on a plane in Cleveland, and she flew to Portland and met up with a lady friend from our last pastorate in, um, uh, from uh, Virginia and came and met her there for the retreat. Then they drove down for the retreat, and I worked my way then beginning Friday um, across uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New England to here. And, um, and then in the midst of that, then I'm getting emails uh, on my phone from different people and uh, from Sharon and saying that she had a stomach bug and I didn't want any part of that and so um, uh, so uh, I was glad for the uh, for brother Larry and, and Diane who graciously took me in then last night and I was not as bubbly as I usually am I've just been exhausted on this trip so we just sat out for a while at the fire pit out back and kicked up my feet and I think I was in bed at 9.30 last night and that's a very unusual thing. But grateful to be here this morning and so far for the safety for both Wanda and I, looking forward to reuniting here this afternoon for that. Uh, I would like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Acts and chapter number 2. Acts in chapter number 2. Uh, I almost hesitate to, to even ask you to come to this passage of Scripture, uh, but the more I read it, the more I think upon it, the more it is crucial in our day and age to just consider some church essentials in life for us as the New Testament church. This is a, a passage which, of course, uh, crosses and established churches and churches being established and planted throughout the world today as well. And we need to be reminded of it. I was reminded even this week thinking about this passage and some other things and ministering in some other churches and talking to some of my missionaries this week and realizing that sometimes we just make everything so complicated rather than the simple essentials of a local New Testament church. And if these things are not essential in our churches and a part of our churches, then we're just simply missing the boat. And uh, we need to go back and consider those things. Um, I often wonder, and this is not to be critical of a church bulletin or a church prayer bulletin, but I've often wondered in recent days if we could ever survive without printing a bulletin. I wonder if we could survive if we did not have a prayer list for our churches on Wednesday nights. Uh, or whether we should just sometime think about, all right, let's get rid of a Wednesday night prayer list. Because sometimes I feel like we pray through it like a grocery list or a phone book. 
And let's really just ask God to help us to consider the things on our heart and the things that God brings to our minds and our hearts in prayer and just pray together and not have to um, be dependent on these external things sometimes. Uh, I just broke something, Pastor. So apparently this is adjustable and I... I, I, I probably should just keep my hands to my side now. So, uh, And these things are just so critical for us to be reminded. Sometimes we become established churches and we, we are for 50, 70, 100, 200 years, even here in the new Northeast and New England, there are churches that are many hundreds of years old and they're still true, many of them, but we become so complicated over the years. Church constitutions become reactionary many times rather than just considering what does the Bible want us to do and say and the constitutions are important and we need to have them. But sometimes when we have an issue, we try to policy it out rather than biblically just dealing with issues. And so let me, let me bring you back to this passage of Scripture and you understand what's taking place here. We have our Lord's Ascension in chapter number 1, and then as you come to the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, you have uh, the disciples, and it's a multitude of disciples meeting, and they're hiding in one sense in, in an upper room and behind a door, and they're waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and on the day of Pentecost, which we now see in chapter number 2, we see especially with the Spirit of God coming upon these men and dwelling in these men and the church is founded and the church has begun and Peter's magnificent message here. And then we come to the towards the end of this chapter and we want to focus particularly on two verses in verse number 41 and 42 and uh, dwell there for a few moments when when we read by uh, the inspiration of the scriptures they had been written here, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now I have learned from this passage as well as uh, 40 some years of ministry now that if a church is to be true and strong and faithful these things will be the primary focus. These must be the primary focus. These cannot only be the directives for the pastor but all of the church people must come to grips with these things and say this is what I need to be and this is what we need to be corporately as a body. Now both of those things are important. Individually we need to have these things so to speak in our life but corporately as we see in this passage of scripture the importance of them. Often we would call these things the fundamentals or the basics um, of a church and without these a church will fail and sometimes we just have to stop and simplify things and ask ourselves questions. Why do we do what we do? Why have we continued to do this and maybe it doesn't work and there's nothing happening? Is God blessing that? Do we need to come back and re-examine who we are as a church of Jesus Christ? So let's consider this. I see five things in this passage of Scripture that would be those essentials. As we look at verse 41, he says, Then they that gladly received His word... I see their evangelism that is taking place. Now when we see that he says his word, we must go back and understand the context. And the context is referring here to Peter's message, which has to do about Christ. And so if you would go back to verse number 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel, he's coming to a conclusion here of his message, know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. This is what evangelism is all about. This is what the gospel is all about. It is about Christ. 
It is about what the Father and His eternal plan has done in sending His Son, Himself in His Son, Jesus Christ to this earth to redeem His people from their sins. That's the message historically that the church has emphasized and that's the message that we in the church in 2017 must emphasize as well. It was exciting when I talked to Wanda for just for a few minutes or so. They were coming down off the mountain. What was that mountain called? She told you. Batty. What is it? Batty. Batty? Okay, I won't ask you how to spell it. You'll tell me later. Um, and while they were up there, they had an opportunity to talk of Christ to a man up there on, on, on the mountain. And I said, that is so cool that you had that opportunity to do that just uh, Friday, I believe that it was, while they were doing a little bit of sightseeing before the, the conference. But that's what it's all about. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. And folks, if we forget that the very essence of why we are here, then we are failing. So let me kind of bring it personally to you. You've just started Awana again. What's Awana all about? Teaching Bible verses? No. Playing games? No. It's all about Christ. And those young people, boys and girls who are without Christ, they need Christ. They can learn all the Bible verses that they can and do that and memorize the whole Bible. But if they don't know Christ, they're lost and will spend eternity in hell. And it's our responsibility. It's our duty. It is the first call of the church is to preach Christ. To preach Christ. Sometimes I'm in churches and I'm, I'm there and I just pop in and I'm just listening and fellowshipping and visiting, meeting new pastors and churches as part of the ministry that I do. And sometimes I never hear Christ mentioned. Everything they've said is good. Everything they've talked about is right. But they've not mentioned the, the key to it all. And it's Christ. Christ who suffered on the cross and took our shame and took our penalty and sacrificed Himself for us and for me that I might have eternal life by the forgiveness of my sins. I was a rotten, rebellious sinner. And I could not do anything to merit favor before a holy and righteous God. And He and His marvelous plan through the person of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit saved me from my sin. And that's evangelism. That's what it's all about. Even sometimes when we are just tired and weary and we just say, you know, I really don't want to talk to anybody today that God will bring opportunities and sometimes we pass them up. And sometimes the Spirit of God moves us to say, you're not passing this up. And I was, uh, I was getting on a plane um, and a couple of years ago and as I, I always try to meet the people who are next to me and talk to them, find out who they try to have opportunities to talk about the Gospel. Sometimes as soon as they find out who I am, they just look out the window and they don't want to talk to you. you know? But I was sitting and I was just exhausted. I just wanted to go home. And I sat down and there were two seats on this side of this little puddle jumper that I was on to get home. And here I am. I'm sitting in the aisle seat and no one's there. And no one's coming in. And I'm saying, thank you, Lord. I need this time. And then one more guy walked on the plane. Every seat was full with that and it was this huge guy. I mean, he was just, he was not fat. He was just bulk. And I'm thinking, oh God, I don't want this today. <laughs> and he come walking down the aisle. He had tattoos running up and down everywhere. I mean, he was just a huge guy that I didn't want to meet at all. And he stopped and he looked at me and said, um, sir, that would be my seat there. I said, okay. So he sat down and I was, he was big and I was skinny, but I still had to move over because it was just so big. So I introduced myself, got to talking to him a minute, and I said, I don't want to be offensive, but I would like to ask you a question. He said, sure, very polite young man. 
I said, is there a story about the tattoos that you have on your body? And he said, oh, absolutely. He says, can I tell you about it? And I said, I'm all ears. And he started right here, and there was a storyline that went all the way up and on his back and all the way down and on his neck and everything. And, and I said, you know, that was really fascinating. And I asked him what he did. And he says, well, I'm a, I'm a trainer in a gym. I said, well, that makes sense. And so he began to tell me, and I was asking about, I said, do you, do you make good money doing that? He says, oh, yeah, I make great money. He just went on and on. It was just, it was a pleasant conversation. And then he stopped and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, what do you do? <laughs> And that's a great question. You know, that's why I asked them that question. And I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a missionary. He goes, really? And we got talking, and he had a Hispanic name and a Hispanic background. And so we got to talking, and I was able to share Christ with him and the gospel. And he was uh, from a Catholic family. He says, that is really fascinating. And, and we got to talking, and I shared the gospel, and, and uh, he was very open, and and he speaks Spanish, so we did things bilingually. And so I asked him if he had a Bible, and he didn't. So I gave him my bilingual Bible. So I, I carry some inexpensive bilingual Bibles that I use. I just gave it to him. He was so appreciative of that. But that's what it's about. I was tired. I wanted to sleep. I just wanted to go home. And God brought somebody that he needed to hear the gospel. And I needed to be reminded that that's the purpose of of life for us as believers. And he said, they that gladly received his word. What word was that? It was the word that you have crucified Jesus Christ and God has said he is the Lord and he is the Christ, the Messiah. And what does it say? That when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts in the next verse. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. I can't do that. Only the Spirit of God can do that. But my responsibility is to preach Christ. So let me ask you a simple question. When was the last time you had the opportunity or took the opportunity or looked for the opportunity to talk to somebody about Christ? There are opportunities everywhere. And we just don't take the opportunities. We don't even have to pray for them. God just brings people to us every day along the way. And that's exactly what Matthew 28 is all about. As you are going. It says, go ye therefore. You know, but the, 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 the participle really is, as you are going, while you're going through the course of this life, make disciples. Talk about Christ. Let me ask you, do you talk about Christ at home? That's important to do. If you're not talking about Christ amongst people as here, friends, it's going to be even more difficult for you to talk about Christ when you're looking and talking to those who are at work or your neighbors. And you can talk to Christ about your neighbors and you'll either continue to make neighbors or they'll run away from you. But last summer, you probably remember some of you reading our newsletter, we had 45 neighbors one night in our home. Because it's important for us to know our neighbors and it's important for us that they know who we are. It's important for us that they come to know who Christ is. And, and, and we invited people. We did not have any idea. To know. And, and, and here comes a couple into our home. Ron Schrock. You know Ron Schrock? He lives two blocks from me. I didn't know that. And here he was. They're so excited. And so I got an email from the Shrocks just recently. He was a, an, he's an evangelist. He used to be on BJ staff. And he just recently sent, they sent me, she did, sent me an email and said, we have a new neighbor two doors down. And he's a Hispanic. and doesn't speak much English. You need to go and see him. And so we're getting ready to have another neighborhood meeting at our home. And we're praying that God continues to have us build those relationships. Evangelism. Taking the gospel to people who need Christ. Folks, it's all about Christ. And that's what it was here. It's always, always about Christ. There is no church without Christ. There is no salvation without Christ. 
There is no hope without Christ. And we have the hope of eternal life in us, and we have the message of hope for those who do not know Christ. That's an essential aspect of the church. So let me just challenge you. Keep Christ and the gospel foremost. Because wherever you go, wherever you walk, you're going to see people who need Christ. And, and it may be difficult to try to reach some of them. And it may be difficult to even get somebody to listen to you. I pulled up this morning, and there were three people standing out there. All three guys were shirtless, and they were just carrying on. One was a son, I think. And I heard the wife, and she was there putting clothes out on the, on the thing. I said, you know, those people probably need Christ. Maybe we don't even know their names. And that would be a shame for us. I'm not trying to... Well, maybe I am trying to shame you if you don't know their names. I just I should just say that, you know. Because that's what it's all about. Those people are, are going to go to hell unless they come to Christ. And we need to be mindful of that. And that's why we need to pray for these kind of people. For everybody to come to. Well, we've got to move on. We'll never get in through this passage. So let's go. Uh, chapter 2, verse 41. And they that gladly received uh, his word, that's the message of Peter, were baptized. That's an evidence of people who have come to Christ. They follow the Lord in obedience. And then the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They were added to the local assembly. And then it says in verse 42, second of all, and they, that, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. A lot of churches don't even want to talk about doctrine. But that's the core here. Christ and doctrine. And sometimes people say, well, we just want to talk about Christ but not doctrine. They go hand in hand just like a glove does. Because Christ, Christology is the study of Christ, Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. And you can go all through the doctrines we need. We cannot study the Bible without studying doctrine. And sometimes we need to systematize that as we go through and understand what the Bible says. And that's why we preach expositionally through books and passages of Scripture so that we can understand that the way it is. I actually heard a message not long ago and I just... I, I just about blurted out and screamed out in the service that a man read a verse of Scripture from Proverbs and in that verse was the word blood. And from that he built a message on well, about physical blood and what it is, what it does, why it's in our bodies and all of these things. And then he went and found verses and spiritualized that. And then from there, he, he, he put on a chart all the blood types. He got through that and then he stopped and he asked this question. Do you know what blood type Jesus had? And that just perked me up because I'm thinking, this is going someplace it shouldn't go. And he went down through and said, this blood type can go to these blood types, can be... Um, given here, donated, this blood type to these, this to this, 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 this. And he got all the way down to the last one of O negative, and he says, this blood type can go to everybody. <coughs> and he said, Jesus had O negative blood type. And I'm thinking, that is just pure heresy to say that. And then he says, you know how I know this? And then he quoted John 3.16. And I'm thinking, I should, I, I, I should just jump out of my seat and declare this as a heretical message. Because that's really what it was. And, and people are there just drinking this stuff in. Folks, that's why it's important to take the Scriptures and open the Scriptures and passage by passage and say, what does this say? What does this mean? And then as we understand those things in its literal, historical, grammatical context, then we can ask the question, how can I apply this text to my life today understanding those things? 
But many churches want to start right here and say, what does this mean to me? And my usual response is, it doesn't make any difference what it means to you at all. Nor does it make any difference what it means to me. But we have to come and say, what is God saying here? And he's saying that the, the doctrine that the apostles have been teaching and they're listening to, he identifies it as the apostles' doctrine, the things that Peter is teaching. And then as we see Paul come to Christ and as Paul teaches, and then we see the letters to Timothy and Titus. That's why I didn't choose to preach out of Titus this morning because I didn't want you to compare what I would say as to what my wife said the last couple of days. I actually read her notes. They were pretty good. So if you ever hear me preach it, it might be my wife's notes. But, but it's important for us to come and, and to see it and to ask, what does God say? This is what God wrote. We have to look at it that way. And for you to come to a church and somebody read a passage from 1 Samuel today and just kind of make some statements and then 2 Chronicles next week and then Revelation the next week, you can't understand the Bible that way. It's not what God did. He wrote it systematically in these books and in these letters and that's how we must read and that's how we must study otherwise we are violating the scriptures it's interesting that this same man who talked about the blood just the week before in a Sunday school class was teaching out of Revelation and the end of Revelation 22 says about not adding or subtracting from the word of God and I'm thinking you're missing it you're just missing it Doctrine. Sound of doctrine. You get into 1 Timothy and chapter 1 and chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 and all of Titus and Paul is emphasizing to Timothy and Titus good sound doctrine. Good sound doctrine. And it's so important to grow as a believer and to grow as a church as a true Christian loves to read and study the Word of God with the people of God. Doctrine teaching that God has given to us here. So what does he say next then? He says not only did they continue in that, but they continued in fellowship. And the word fellowship is an interesting word. It, it, it is based on the idea of communion, having something in common. What do we have in common? Well, predominantly we have Christ in common. And in secondary, we have this thought of evangelism in, co in common. You know, it ought to be a, a, a normal thing for us on Sundays and on Wednesdays, if that's when your evening uh, prayer meeting is, is to be identifying, praying for people, saying, I, I met so-and-so, would you pray for them that God would continue to give me the opportunity to talk to them someplace about Christ? I mean, it's good to talk about broken feet and... and, and and cancer, and these, we need to pray for those things. So don't misunderstand me. But if we're not actively sharing with one another people that we are trying to disciple in Christ and bring along in Christ, maybe our perspectives are wrong. And then the fellowship that we have in common together, we tend to think that fellowship is sitting around a table of food. We often call that fellowship. But it's not necessarily fellowship unless we are united in talking about the things of God around the table like that. Otherwise, it's just a time of, of eating and talking about things of this world. But fellowship can happen in all kinds of places. You can have fellowship with a fellow believer in the parking lot of Walmart. But you may be sitting downstairs at a dinner and not have fellowship together. Because fellowship is based around Christ and on Christ and who He is and what He has done. Now we may say, well, that's hard to believe being a Baptist because, you know, we just eat. That's what we do best. Uh, you get into a Spanish Baptist church and you'll really know what eating is like. And I love to eat. Wanda says, I don't eat three meals a day. I just graze all day long. But that's not fellowship. Fellowship is when we are united around the commonality of Christ. Because just like evangelism, it's all about Christ. Fellowship is not based upon the sociability of people or an occasional gathering. 
but it is entailed in the physical and emotional and spiritual needs of one another around the person of Christ. That's what chapter 2, and we don't have time to even think about it, but verses 40 through and 47 is all about. <coughs> you know, I can read a portion. And fear came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And what a wonderful picture of fellowship. It was the mark of their church is that when they came together as a body of believers, as a family, it was the pulse of their lives. In, in churches around the world today, in places of China and, and uh, uh, different uh, countries of, of Asia, when they come together, they come together in secrecy, many of them. They're not sitting around and talking about the day's football game. They're spending the day talking about Christ and praying together and reading the Scriptures. And some of those churches only have a portion of the Scriptures. And some of them, like in the old days behind the Iron Curtain uh, of Russia, that in the Soviet Union, one church would have one Bible of 200 people perhaps. And sometimes they would take that Bible and they would cut the binding apart and they would take the book of Genesis and give it to this family who may have a couple of families around them where they live. And the book of Matthew and give to this family and Luke to that family. And they would read and study these passages of Scripture at home and they'd come together and then maybe in a month or something after that they would exchange the books of the Bible. They'd be gathered together around lunchtime and fellowshipping and talking about Christ and what they've learned from the Bible. On the average church today, people come together and they never talk about what God is doing in their lives. And, and the fellowship is based around that. I was in some deep conversations with some brothers this week and just confessing my heart to them as well. I mean, I'm, I'm the leader of some of these people and we're talking about things and I'm reading this book, I'm on my second time through it and and, and, and it's called Gospel Treason. I would highly commend this book to you to read. Gospel Treason. Maybe even a Bible study of somehow to work it out. But it's, but it's all about exposing the idols of your heart. It's been a brutal book for me. It has probably been one of the hardest books I have ever read to help in my studies to expose the idols of my heart. And we have had sweet fellowship together. We sat around a table, about four or five of us, and as we're doing this, we're talking about what God is doing in our lives and how He's... And we begin at times to weep, and times we laugh, and times we stop and pray. That was fellowship because it was all around Christ and what He's doing in our lives. The Bible tells us if we were to go and we don't have time to 1 John chapter 1 that fellowship for the Christian is centered around the Father, the Son, and one another. The first, the first chapter of John exposes that to us. This was their life. These people, the first church, have come together, 3,000 of them, plus the disciples that were up in the upper room, and Peter and all of them were together, and they are continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship together. And it was done harmoniously together. They're teaching the doctrine. They would fellowship with one another, talking about Christ with each other, what God has done in their lives. That was their pulse. And he said, and then they were also involved in the breaking of bread. Now I believe in particular that this passage of breaking of bread is speaking particularly right here of the Lord's table. 
It was a unique and special time when the body here, as I see it as a corporate situation, the body is together and now they have learned doctrine and they're fellowshipping together. Now they're breaking the bread, they're coming to the table of the Lord. The table of the Lord is one of the most wonderful, expressive, and important times for a church to come together. If you intentionally miss the table of the Lord on a regular basis, I'd ask you to examine yourself and your walk with Christ. It is such an important part of what Christ has ordained for us as a body of believers. We see it outlined for us so greatly in 1 Corinthians 11. And, and we have turned it into an idol sometimes, a monthly ritual that we just do because that's what we do. But it is a time that's very special for us to remember what Christ has done and remember and to know what He's doing now and the hope of the future of what He's going to do for us. And there ought to be praises and singing and joy and heartache and sorrow and, and, and all that is encompassed in the whole plan of the eternal God. I mean, when you think about the Lord's table, you come together and He says, do this in remembrance of me. And we're talking about His broken body and His shed blood. And we say, well, where did that all come from? It came from Ephesians chapter 1, when the Father ordained this before the foundation of the world. And so our time can be thought of also says we want to praise God for the eternal plan of God way before the foundation of the world. Before anything was made or created, God had a plan for us. And you know what He did? He worked that out that this creation that He did rebelled against Him and broke that fellowship in order to rectify that, that eternal plan was to send His Son, the second person of the Trinity, to come in the form of a man and, and, and to live and perfectly keep the law and to die upon the cross at the very creation that He created. And that He would redeem us by His blood and that the Holy Spirit would bring all that together through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the understanding of our minds and our hearts that He would change us to call upon Him to save us from our sins. Wow, that's just a portion of that. What a marvelous thing to think about the table of the Lord. I, I, I personally think that when we have the table of the Lord, we ought to dedicate the whole service to it. The table of the Lord. And then it becomes a, a wonderful gathering of God's people. It's a special time. Well, then he also says, and we need to begin to wrap this up here a little bit. Uh, he says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And this often steps on our toes because I believe that particularly this is talking about a corporate gathering of God's people together and that would emphasize a matter of corporate prayer. And then church one time they had prayer, they had all kinds of prayers and people in the church stood up in a morning service and they prayed and, and we get so enamored it says, oh we got an hour so you know we have to cram everything in here in an hour. But this church, they, they went for their morning services, usually about two hours long. And, and there was nothing boring about it. I, I did not even realize two hours had gone by. And, and they had a time of prayer, and, and they had called on certain men to, to come and to pray on behalf of the congregation. One came to, 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 to pray that God would, would identify their idols and to identify the sinfulness of their own hearts and they would repent of that individually and then corporately we give ourselves to you. And then there was a prayer of time for the people of God and growth and prayer for the, for the pastors and prayer for the, the leaders of the church and prayer for the widows and all kinds of prayer was going on. And you walked away saying, you know, we have met with God today. Corporate prayer. You know, prayer 
is really just an expression of dependence and praise. That, Lord, we are dependent upon you. We can't accomplish anything. We are just sinful, redeemed people, and we can't do anything without you. And, and therefore, we are here dependent upon you to move. And so as we pray that, we say, Lord, there are people that need to be saved around us. And, and, and as, as the Thessalonians and the Bereans and those passages of Scripture and Acts would identify, there are much people here. Perhaps there are people that God's hand is upon now. And God, we need for your wisdom to be bestowed upon us so we can pray and ask you, oh God, save people in our midst. And let us be an instrument for that. The disciples as a body continued in prayer until Christ sent the Holy Spirit. That's, that's a passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 1 there that we see. Now how soon we forget or neglect the importance of prayer personally and corporately. We talk about prayer. We have prayer meetings, but we really do very little praying. Individually, in their passage of Scripture is Luke chapter 8 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and pray without ceasing that we should always have a mindful uh, attitude of praying and talking to God wherever we go. And corporately, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 12, Colossians chapter 4, James chapter 5, and many other passages are emphasizing the matter of corporate prayer. Now, may I say that the prayer meeting of a church is probably one of the most important gatherings of a body of believers. And if we are too busy to come together to pray, then we are just too busy. A, a church... I don't think can really thrive and grow and or survive without a thriving prayer meeting. So maybe I'm saying something now that the pastors wish they could say, because sometimes it just takes an outsider to come in and say these things. Because I, I, I can, I can gun and run, you know, kind of a thing. And uh, so, uh, but in love, that what I see here this morning should be here in prayer meeting. Because you're the body of Christ here. And if you were to take and do your study, which you probably have done over the years, on the one another's of the Scriptures, some of that is praying one for another. And sometimes you just cannot effectively do that unless it's in a corporate setting. And, and I believe that the Scriptures identify through all these passages of Scripture, that we should come together and pray corporately. Together. If a, if a church does not have a corporate prayer meeting, gathering together of the people to pray is the emphasis. Not in the matter of, of, a, of a pastor preaching for 50 minutes and then you wind up praying for 10 minutes. I would say, you need to pray for 50 minutes and then on Wednesday night the pastor share a devotional thought for 10 minutes and to really come before the throne of God praising God begging of God to work in our lives individually maybe a simple illustration our prayer meeting and my last pastor is when we would come together I'd give a short devotional we'd sing one song and then we would pray we did away with the prayer sheets and then, and then we would take some requests and then we would just gather in groups to pray. And we had a lot of young people that came to our prayer meeting. And, and uh, when I was seeing that growing, uh, one of the deacons asked me, what do we do with that? I said, well, instead of praying with somebody that you prayed with for the last 20 years, why don't you pray with a young person? And he says, well, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, it's time to break out of your comfort zone with that then. 
And so we would start doing this, and I, as we get ready to break up, I said, we have some young ladies here, and I would like those young ladies, some of them were teenagers, some of them were junior age girls who were faithful in coming to church without their parents, and I said, some of you older women need to do exactly what you heard this week in Titus chapter 2, women teaching women, and you need to gather them with you in groups. And not take them all at one group, but take this woman, take that person, take this person, that person, and I've actually had people say, but I'd, but I'd rather pray as an adult. We'll pray as an adult some other time. But now's the time to minister and help these young people to grow and know how to pray. And I'll never forget, I was praying with one, uh, one or two men and we had one or two young people with us in our group. We had about five of us. And this one 12-year-old boy, Mark, so we're praying. I'm trying to help our people to pray. And I'm praying for Mark personally. And I'm, I'm saying, Lord, help Mark to come to the understanding of who he is. That, he, that he's a sinner without Christ. And he needs to call upon Christ to save him from his sin so that he has the assurance of eternal life. And I, I, I actually had an adult tell me, that could be embarrassing. I said, well, I'd, I'd rather him hear the truth. And I'd rather pray for him that God would work his life. And you know, a couple of weeks later, after prayer meeting, he was in the same prayer circle with me. We didn't have him all the time. And he came up to me and says, Pastor, can I talk to you? I went in my office and I led him to Christ that night. Because I prayed for him particularly. And I, I pray for the spiritual growth of my men. And pray for him by name. I may not always divulge the things that I know, but I pray that I, I, I know this brother is struggling with this uh, with a particular thing. Lord, would you help him? Help him to grow in this matter. Help him to, to, to abandon this thing. And it may not be some great sinful thing. But that's what prayer meeting is all about. And we need to get that focus back to praying for ourselves for those around us, for people who need Christ. Without much prayer, a church is not going to thrive and grow. It's just an impossibility. It, it's like a pond I saw one time, and I went to, to go fishing in it, and I walked down, I was at a camp, and I said, oh man, there couldn't be a fish alive in this pond. It was, it was stagnant. No water came in, no water was going out. It just sat there stagnant. And, and the garbage that was grown on top of it, is, you, know, you wanted to try to walk across it. That's how thick it was. And I thought, a lot of Christians are just like that. A lot of churches are just like that. They're just stagnant. There's nothing happening in their lives. They, they, they don't really pray. They don't know how to pray. And we, need, we need to stop playing the games of prayer time. And we just need to talk to God. And say, oh God, we're so dependent on you. I was in a church one time and never met this guy. It was time for prayer and this guy came up to pray with me. I was visiting, he was visiting. And the guy was just, he looked like a, what we would call a bum. That's what he looked like, a bum off the street, homeless off the street. And he had just gotten saved. And we talked for a minute. I asked him if he'd like to pray and he said yes he would. And he just talked to God like he was his best friend. And I was almost embarrassed to pray. A guy had been in the ministry at that time for probably 25 years. I learned more about prayer from that guy who had just been saved a few days than I had through all of my Christian life through Bible college and pastoring and preaching. It was, it, he just sat down. I don't even think he closed his eyes. And he just said, God... I'm just so thankful you saved me. And just talk. Poor grammar. Didn't have the theological terms that we use. He just talked to God. Like his best friend. And that's what we need to do. I think if we could get back to that, we might see God do some tremendous things in our lives. Well, let me finish going back to the first part of verse 42. If I could do that, please. And he says this. And they continued steadfastly. I think that's the crux of it. They continued steadfastly. What in? In evangelism, in doctrine, in fellowship, and breaking bread and prayer. They continued steadfastly. That's a, that's a mark of a 
godly church and a godly Christian. They just continue. I call them steady eddies. They just keep going. They're just plotters. They continued. It's the idea of devotion. They just simply devoted themselves to these things. This was what it was all about. And they weren't going to deviate from that. Now we know that as you follow through the history of the, of the Scriptures, and as you get into the 2nd century, 3rd century on down, that there have been many a churches that have deviated and have gone. But at least here we see that they were committed they, to continue to be devoted in these things. So let me ask a question as I close then, or a couple of questions would be, how about you individually? I have been known to just come right down the line, so how about you, and how about you, and how about you, and how about you? Are you devoted to these things? As an individual, are you devoted that this is what my life is going to be about? If nothing else takes place in my life, if I accomplish nothing else in my life, this is what I'm going to be devoted about. And then as a corporate body, I'd even suggest pastor and deacons. Sit around in a deacons meeting sometime and just read this passage of Scripture and say, how are we doing with evangelism? What are we doing? Ask ourselves a question. Say, Say, Deacon, so and so, how are you doing? When was the last time you gave a track out? When was the last time you invited somebody to church? And not to do it to embarrass, but to do it to say, man, none of us are doing anything. And then maybe as a corporate body of believers, ask the same questions. How about us? Are we involved in evangelism? Or are we really involved in doctrine? What are, what are we doing? Sit around as deacons and just say, and then maybe bring your Sunday school teachers in and say, what are we teaching in Sunday school? Are we teaching us teaching this, teaching about Daniel today, and next week we teach about Jonah, and next week we teach about some somebody else? Are we actually teaching the Bible? We teach we have taken it and we've made stories. And so when when the young people get fifteen and sixteen and eighteen, they they're they're already thinking about other things. But these are just stories, and so why do I no, this is God's eternal work. Jonah was a real person, and here's how we know this. And instead of talking about Jonah one Sunday and then next Sunday about Daniel in the lion's den, instead of making these stories, we need to emphasize this as this is what God is teaching us here. And so ask ourselves these questions. We may need to examine. We did that in my last book. We examined every Sunday school literature that we used and we threw most of them away. Doctrine. Are we teaching our young people doctrine? That's why some of them, they go to college, they're secular college, and they know nothing. They don't know how to defend their faith. And then they abandon the faith. Doctrine. Fellowship. How are we doing in fellowship? Good question. How are we doing in fellowship? How are we doing around the Lord's table? Does it really mean something? Or we just do it? And then, how are we doing in prayer? I guess I would just simply call that taking spiritual inventory of my own life and then the life of the church. And saying, here are five essential aspects. How are we doing with that? Well, let's pray. Ask God to help us. And then pastor will come and close as he sees fit. All right?